yes hello good morning everybody so yeah we had a small reminder of the series that we're going through from dilip from the book of second kings chapter 5 the life of life of who naman neman anything yeah but i'll be saying naman i've been reading tamil bible a lot so in tamil bible it's naman so hindi also is naman so then it should be naman <laughs> the second kings is missing from my bible ah found it yes okay. so yes i know the last part 2 was a couple of weeks back and the memory is fade in 2 hours only i have short term memory loss I, i know many husbands suffer with that same disease but yeah it's okay it's uh, we can do a quick refresher so yeah so what are, what what is happening in naaman's life what happened what has thus far happened ha huh? he had leprosy yes so what is he doing because of that leprosy yes yes he is planning to come to the israelites planning to come to the king of israel so we last week tarang spoke about he con- concluded on irresistible grace he read from philippians chapter 1 verse 6 he said he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion so this was still on track no matter what it looked like in the palace so what did we see in the palace and which palace are we talking about on mysore palace what palace what is continuing what will come to f- completion so so uh, queen elizabeth is healing in the mysore palace no so we are talking about the israelite king the palace of the king of israel so naaman is coming to the palace of the king of israel with an official letter from the king of aram so that is what is the good work that has started in naaman's life that is why yes, i read philip philippians 1:16 he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion so this week this is the agenda so yeah g for grace if you didn't know so yeah now whatever happened in the palace has happened so what did the king of israel do he tore his clothes when naaman asked him for healing am oh i god he's is like what am oh i god we asking him for me for healing he's having a decree from the king of aram so provide healing to this uh, man called Naaman how do we know this let's quickly read some scripture let's turn to second kings chapter 5 verse 7 as soon as the king of israel read the letter he tore his robes and said am i god can i kill and bring back to life why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me so this particular statement shows that the king of israel in this case jeroboam doesn't even know about a prophet called elisha is existing in his kingdom existing in israel existing in samaria part of israel but some random person from some other enemy kingdom called aram is listening to his wife's servant who knows that there is a prophet called elisha in the kingdom of israel in samaria we saw that in the previous verse in the first seven verses we saw that and he is coming to the king of israel and asking and the king of israel like 0% faith is like what i can't, i can't do anything god take this letter and go home and i don't want any trouble that is what his reaction is the prophet elisha intervenes the prophet got wind of what was happening in the palace how elisha had a cctv in the palace no we see from the same chapter 5 of second kings verse 26 let's jump ahead verse 26 but elisha said to him was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you so this was elisha is talking to gehazi his servant servant gehazi where he would have done something behind elisha's back and elisha will confront him without knowing anything i mean definitely there was no cctv camera back then right So how does Elisha know all of this? He got a wind of what was happening. He exactly found out 
what was happening in the palace we are not told how right here but he found out elisha found out and what is he saying let's read verse 8 first just verse 8 when elisha the man of god heard that the king of israel had torn his robes he sent him this message he's sending the king a message why have you torn your clothes have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in israel so what does the verse say exactly verse 8 he's not saying elisha is not saying that i will provide healing to this man i will cure his leper elisha never says that what he says exactly why have you torn your robes have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in israel so elisha is sending a message to the king of jeroboam severely rebuking him tearing off his clothes and accusing the king of aram to trying to pick a fight is it it showed that the king of israel was interpreting this entire thing in a godless way faithless way so what what is elisha trying to do here is elisha trying to be faithful and provide healing because just because he has a letter no elisha is looking at a bigger picture the prime goal of elisha is not to just give healing to naaman naaman my god the english have converted me but yeah so his prime goal is not healing he not he never says i'm going to give healing what is his prime goal let's go to the spoiler of the entire story let's look at verse 15 then naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of god he stood before him and said now i know that there is no god in all the world except in israel this was the prime goal of elisha elisha Naaman is not saying oh now i have provided the greatest healing that was not naaman's word naaman's exact words were now i know that there is no god in all the world except in israel this is what Eli- elisha wants this is what elisha's prime goal for naaman's life is this is what god has for naaman's life have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in israel never mentions healing So when Naaman heard the invitation from the messenger of Elisha, what is Naaman doing? He he quickly went out of the palace like one like flash. Look, he went because the next verse, verse nine. Can anybody read verse nine? Yeah, the next verse itself, the eighth verse. is the message message ninth verse is already there he came with horses chariots and stood at the door of elisha's house already and the message didn't even say healing so how did this look like in biblical times let's look at a a, a visual of how that will look like so this is naaman little bandages and all with all his horses chariots all the riches the golds so all of his attendees standing outside he went with the entire entourage ready to do business with israel's greatest prophet elisha but what was elisha doing did elisha come out and greet oh yes hello sir so this is the who's who's name in who's 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 he commander of the army of the kingdom of aram so in today's world that will be the defense minister of a country is a very big delegate so if a delegate comes to your door i mean if a delegate meets another delegate itself that's one big photo opportunity but if a delegate is coming to a normal citizen's house how how huge is that it look like something like this a delegate meeting another delegate so official business so where is naaman coming from he is coming from meeting the king of israel the king of israel has given an audience to naaman the ki- the king of israel agreed to meet with naaman but what is elisha doing sends a messenger 
look at the previous picture there was one messenger coming and talking to the the delegation namans entire party and what was elisha doing busy he was just attending phone calls replying to emails and all of that i mean yeah yeah work from home he was doing work from home he was replying to emails sending some uh, messages to the king of jeroboam but yeah i mean can you just imagine uh, i mean this is the the important people the, the party standing outside the defense minister of an entire country of your neighboring nation and i just sorry bro i'm busy can you uh, i'll just send a message to my messenger yeah, i'll just send on sms just read it and you come let's read verse 10 can anybody read verse 10 Oh man, this had to be a scene. This had to be quite a scene for Naaman to stand there and listen to the words of the servant. Elisha didn't come. Rather, he sent his servant to the door with these particular instructions that Rumi just read. This treatment did not go well with Naaman. How do we know? We read further. So we see Naaman putting up a tantrum. He didn't expect Elisha to ignore him completely and not give him any respect. Diplomatically, you go and meet the defense minister of a country. He's a he's a foreign chief of staff. So let's read verse eleven. Anybody? so naman is thinking of something else when he talks about healing but what is elisha's command go to which particular river jordan and historically the river of jordan something like this is a muddy river and naman he looks at the river and is like what i am the defense minister of one country i am this fellow not even coming to meet me in face to face and he's telling me to go dip in on some uh, dirty river that two seven times so what who does he think i am I, he's becoming so upset we just read verse 11 this is definitely not what naman had envisioned what has happened what has taken over naman what has come over him because pride yes pride because all this while he has been listening to his wife the servant the king and then the messenger and finally he's there and then he got the message and he's like no hey, what is this some dirty river is telling me to go how oh, he's not even coming to me in person salvation is not on our terms healing was not on naman's terms naman wanted something very grand some waving of the hand a big delegation so everybody surrounding him everything this is what he was expecting this was naman's terms this was his expectation of healing but what what is the reality the reality is that he had leprosy and that he was standing in front of elisha's house and he needed healing not a ceremonial incantation not a waving of the hand not something fancy not some magic soup he needed healing that is why he is there but he lost sight of that entire journey that entire mission that why he is there all because of what pride so let's dive deeper into verse 10 what made naman so angry why is naman not the director of this event because elisha's command clearly says go make a trip to the jordan which is a dirty river in the enemy's land in israel jordan is part of israel whereas naman is an aramean he had to get down on his knees and hands without clothes he had to dip himself completely head to toe in that muddy water 
and not just once, seven times you have to do that. So Norman started to think as a natural man. He's like, okay, let me go back to Damascus. Let me go back to the clean river. Let me, let me just go back. All of this is useless. I'm not doing all of, all of these things. There's too much for me. I'm just going to go back. But it is never on our terms that the Lord heals us physically or spiritually. It is never on our terms. We often, we want to be the co-pilot and often we want to take over. We want to be the pilot also. But salvation is altogether God's domain. Healing is altogether God's domain. We can't control the date of salvation. We can't control the direction of healing. No, that is altogether God's domain. Why is Naaman reacting like this? And why am I saying that it is applicable even for today? Recall that Naaman is an Aramean and they were used to manipulating their gods. That was their view of divine beings. Their gods had limited sovereignty, limited by their peculiar specializations and geographical boundaries. God must be kept in this place. God must be kept in that place. That's it. He's bounded. God is bounded in this particular compound wall. That was their view. Naman was not used to dealing with a God who called all the shots. Yes. Sometimes I know we uh, like to believe that, ah, yeah, I call all the shots. I'm the man of the house. But no, God calls all the shots. That is God's sovereignty. Over everything and over everyone. But what Naman is doing, Naman wanted to be at least partly in control. At least, at least, come on, uh, Elisha, come on, at least do some little wave, no? That is what Naman is doing. And this is why we cry out for the only cure. What is the only cure for us? The gospel. God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Luke 18, 13. That awful record of ours, that awful record of mine, it can just be wiped clean. Wow, what a phenomenal gospel. Wow. This is the salvation. This is what Naaman wants, but he doesn't know. This is what Elisha is wanting to give to him. It's worth noting that the, this is for the first time in this particular historical uh, record of Naaman's life, that Naaman turns away from his mission. He listened to his wife. His wife's servant is the slave girl. He got the confidence in the prophet of Israel when the slave girl told him. That is why he approached the king of Aram to request permission to go to the king of Israel. He got the permission from the king of Aram. He's assembling all his troops, assembling all his wealth. He's going. And the king of Israel is resisting. Oh, I can't provide healing. Did, did he abandon his mission there? No. He still went to the doorstep of Elisha. He reached Samaria. But he was ready to abandon his entire mission all for pride. Pride blinds. Now, how many of us have been here? I mean, I know I have so often done this exact same thing. I mean, I'll do everything perfectly. Last one, come on, that's it, done, over. I mean, I'm not doing anymore. So throw off. He was ready to abandon his entire mission all because of pride. Naman was acting like one crazy person. Like, I mean, I'm also like that sometimes. He was turning back on the road to Damascus, abandoning his whole mission. Right when he was about to do that, what happens? Someone read verse 13. So who's coming and speaking up to Naman? His servant. So we see that Naman is listening to Inferior voices for quite some time. He listening to his little slave girl. He listened to this slave girl. So this is happening twice. This is the second time. 
What is the slave girl telling Naaman? Come on. So slave girl is telling, if you, if the prophet had told you to do something else, wouldn't you have done it? If the prophet had told you to do something flashy, wouldn't you have done it? So then he's, the prophet is telling you that you're going, you're going to get healed. Please come back on track to your mission. And Naaman listened. Naaman wanted a great thing. He wanted something sensational. He wanted something flashy and brave, like going on a quest for the Holy Grail, like walking on coal, like burnt coal, like doing some fancy stuff. Another photo opportunity he's looking for. But no, what was he presented with instead? Something humiliating, something undignified, something degrading. And he did not want to do this kind of degrading thing, especially in front of his men, because he brought his entire army is there, servants are there, everybody is there. Naaman listened to wise voices from the slave girl to the servant. Naaman is listening. Let's read verse 14. Someone read verse 14. So finally, Naaman listened. He let go of his pride and he listened. He's getting into the water. The, so the, the Jordan River Geographically, it is uh, about 25 to 35 miles away from Samaria, from where Elisha's house is. So from there, it would have taken him a couple of days round trip to come. So in this round trip, he would have had time to let go of his pride, calm down, go into the river. And now he's getting into the river. Verse 14, these are the words, clean like that of a young boy. What a sight that must have been for a general, for, a, for an army general. After all of these battles, he would have had battle scars. He would have been a rough, uh, rough, uh, older person. But the Bible clearly says clean like that of a young boy. This is how Naaman expected to go into the water with, a, with everybody watching with the uh, Naaman there waving his hand. But what, what is the otherwise what was happening? The general, he comes in a chariot. He gets down from the chariot. He has to leave all his attendants. The gold, the silver, the expensive clothing. He has the official letter from the king of Aram given to the addressing the king of Israel. That is like the highest government official document directly from the king. Like from the prime minister, I have a letter. That is bond of a letter. But all these things halt near the river bank. All of these things are behind him. When he has to take a step into the river, the government letter is of no use. His gold and silver is of no use. His fancy clothing is of no use. His entire army is of no use. His entire accolade of servants is of no use. He's leaving all of that on the river bank and he's getting into the river. He even has to remove his robe and get into the river with nothing. Why? As the man of God had told him, we just read in verse 14, as the man of God had told him. This is how he left everything and he's walking into the river. This was how Jesus left everything and he walked to the cross for us. He left any outward sign of authority in the universe. Jesus left everything behind. Naman is being instructed to do the same thing. He's pointing to what is about to come. These things, these earthly things had no part in salvation. They were of no use to us. Those, of, those earthly things, the official letter, the gold, the silver, are of no use for him to get into salvation. Jesus was entering the Nam with Naaman into the river of Jordan. There was no way for Naaman, nor is there for any of us to enter the kingdom of heaven with all these things weighing us down. 
So the Lord brought Naaman to his knees and the Lord humbled him. But the Lord did not humiliate him. Like how Naaman feared. The Lord humbled him, not humiliate him. We are also brought into humble submission. The Lord takes us into situations where we are humbled. He does not avoid those situations. Like in the case of Daniel. Daniel was not spared of the lion's den. He was spared in the lion's den. The same thing with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were not spared of the fire. They were spared in the fire. Jesus was with them in there. Same thing will, same promise God is giving us. God is not sparing us of any troubles in our life, but he will be there with us in our troubles. We are brought to humble submission in our troubles. Naaman came out joyfully out of the river with a new and healthy body, sporting flesh like that of a young boy. It would have taken some time for the people around him to get accustomed to this new, uh, new face, new skin of Naaman. Even Naaman would have been surprised. I mean, he's, he's just looking at his own skin. He's, he'll be pinching his own body. Is this, is this really happening? Is this a dream? Am I, am I really healed? That would have been his uh, questions. That would have been his first thought after coming out of the water. And all of the people looking around, they would have been even more surprised. Naaman was transformed in this life and forever. And it was obvious to the eye. Because the leprosy was gone. Yes, his mission is accomplished. But he got more than that. Naaman had no scars on his body. Everybody around him is able to see that. Let's turn to John chapter 3. When Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, Jesus told him that no one can see the kingdom unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus is asking Jesus. How can you be born again when you are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. Yes, obviously not. You can't do that. Jesus was talking about spiritual rebirth, not physical. But Naaman was brought closer than anyone to actual physical rebirth. He didn't go all the way back to his mother's womb, but God took him back pretty far back to the age of a young boy. Can you imagine how Naaman would have felt? I can't even imagine how having leprosy would have felt, but that was the biggest stigma of that time and age. Maybe, maybe a similar 5%, we can compare that with COVID. When you had COVID, oh, mask, oh, go that side, 10 feet distance, mask, separate queue, 14 day quarantine. But when you had leprosy, you are forever quarantined. Can you just imagine that? When you're, when you're healed from that, how, how transformation you would, how, the amount of transformation that Naman would have felt. Wow. His skin was like that of a young boy. That is all scripture says. It may have started with his body, but it quickly moved into his heart and soul. Let's read the last scripture for today. Acts chapter 12, 13 to 15. Can anybody quickly read Acts chapter 12, 13 to 15? Okay, so what is happening? So Peter is Peter was released from his shackles in prison. He's coming, he's knocking on the door. A person called Rhoda was so overjoyed to see Peter that she didn't even open the door and she is going and informing. She's so it's unbelievable for her. and people inside also, they're also, oh what? You must have seen a smoke or something. That's what their reaction was. But let's read, someone read the same Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So what has happened? The church was earnestly praying. So this was verse 5. And in verse 15, it seems like the prayer was answered, right? 
so then what would have been the reaction oh we prayed roda's reaction will be oh we were praying oh peter sir oh come in peter we were praying for you yes lord healed the lord brought you out no but her reaction what let me let me go and tell someone let me go bring and the other people are it must it must be an angel of peter can't be peter fellows you were only praying in verse 5 men you the church was praying is written right we just read the church was praying and when it happened na nah, how can i know same thing would have happened to naman na nah, na nah, what, what is this? some magic let me just go let me check for 2 3 days let me wait for for 5 months if it comes back then ha huh, then i'll do we pray and we pray and we pray to god for something we even believe in theoretical stuff can happen but is but it becomes astounding and too good to be true when it actually happens in our life we don't play the uh, miracle of god we don't play the healing of god we like oh ah really uh, for me i did i get the job did i actually get this healing maybe the tablets did it uh, it is astounding and too good to be true naman had to share this good news this incredible news with elisha he had to express his gratitude for this amazing cure are we running back to god with gratefulness why is a thankful spirit a high priority to god i would like to close with the first verse that we read for today second kings 5:15 now i know that there is no god in all the world except in israel the goal of elisha is accomplished is this being accomplished in our life let's bow down in prayer Lord Jesus thank you for this wonderful time father thank you for speaking to us through your word thank you for speaking to us through the life of naaman lord jesus you selected him you chose him to get the grace you chose him to get this healing lord jesus we are all outsiders to your kingdom lord father you have chosen each and every one of us sitting here you have called us by name god father you know each one of us by name you have selected us by name you have given us salvation lord father you have already given us salvation lord jesus we pray that we will have the heart we will have the heart that you will melt our hearts to receive this salvation on your terms lord jesus not on our terms that we will that we will not that we will not choose to be pilots of our lives rather we give control over to you we give control over to you lord jesus you guide our life you take control just like how you took control of naaman when he stepped on the water lord father he stepped on the water with nothing from his life lord jesus we pray that our lives will be a similar representation of what naaman went through lord father whatever we have here on earth does not matter the only thing that matters is that lord you being with us you coming with us into the water lord father lord we pray that your presence will always goes before us even as we enter this new week lord father we pray that you will this will be a constant reminder for us throughout the week that we are constantly reminded of naaman's life that we are constantly reminded to come back to you with a grateful heart with a thankful mind lord jesus now we commit all of this into your hands lord father even as we even as we near your table lord father the holy communion lord jesus commit all of the elements into your hand lord jesus just like naaman nothing of this earth could save him similar to that the elements the bread and the juice are not going to provide us with salvation it is just a symbol 
of what Jesus did on the cross. It is a reminder of what Jesus did on the cross. But Father, even as we approach the altar, put that in our hearts. Let this be a reminder. Pass the bread and the juice.